Welcome back to Elijah, the Boldest of the Prophets, Part 3. But first I want to ask you a few questions. Have you ever had a mountaintop experience that was followed immediately by a state of depression that was so bad that you wanted to die? Have you ever looked for God in a wind so strong that it would shatter rocks? Have you ever waited for God to show up while you're standing in the middle of an earthquake? Whoa! And have you ever looked for God in a fire? Whew, that's hot. Well, Elijah experienced all these, especially when God wanted to get his attention. But it didn't turn out the way you might think it would have. So let's get started with part three. Elijah, boldest of the prophets, part three. At the end of part two, we left Elijah winning the Olympic race against Ahab on their way back to the palace at Jezreel. But when Ahab got home, he told Jezebel everything Elijah had done, including the way he had killed all the prophets of Baal. So Jezebel sent this message to Elijah, may the gods strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you, just as you killed them. 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 1 and 2. You notice that Ahab tells Jezebel what had happened, and she sends that message to Elijah. You would think that after Ahab told everything, especially about the fire coming from the sky, that Jezebel might want to get on the winning side. But no, this is how it is when someone's power is taken away. They dig in their heels and fight back even harder. Sound familiar? I'm sure we can all think of situations like this. Jezebel was powered by evil, and that made it next to impossible to change sides. 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 3 to 5a. Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. Then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree, also known as a juniper tree, and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. Then he lay down and slept under the broom tree. So what does Elijah do after he sees God's power? He runs. We see a big difference between the Elijah that saw God's power at Mount Carmel, calling down fire and killing 850 prophets, and the Elijah that ran from one woman. Elijah was under God's power on Mount Carmel, but it was the Elijah under his own strength when he ran. Just because we may see God working through us in a miraculous way at one point does not mean that we do the next step on our own. We need to remember where and who our anointing power came from and not get too hasty, to bask in a good impression of ourselves. Now depression sets in. Then he prays to die and falls asleep. Do you know his wish was never granted? But that comes later. We are all capable of extreme depression. If we have been overworked and get overtired, the Bible tells us that both Jeremiah, this is in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 20, verses 14 to 18, and Job, which is in the book of Job, chapter 3, verse 1, both wished they were dead. Chapter 19, verses 5b and 6. But as he was sleeping, an angel touched him and told him, Get up and eat. He looked around, and there beside his head was some baked bread on a hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. How do you feel when someone wakes you up from a deep sleep? What about an alarm clock? And an angel wakes Elijah up. That may be an exceptional case. And then the angel tells him to eat. God has not forgotten Elijah. Even in his humanity, Elijah is remembered by God. He eats and falls asleep. Vincent Blardy once said, Fatigue makes cowards of us all. I think Elijah was exhausted. First Kings 19, verse 7. Then the angel of the Lord came again and touched him and said, Get up and eat some more, or the journey ahead will be too much for you. 
This shows the preparation that Elijah will need shortly. An angel comes a second time and wakes him and tells him to eat because he has a long journey ahead of him. Many of us know what it is like to experience a depletion of adrenaline. Sporting events show this very well. Ever watch the athletes after giving it all in a cross-country race? How about a marathon? They need something to replenish what was lost in the event. Elijah is a good example of this too. Now he needs nourishment for his next step, and I usually lose the word step. 1 Kings 19, verses 8 and 9. So he got up and ate and drank, and the food gave him enough strength to travel 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. There he came to a cave where he spent the night. Another quote by Vince Lombardi seems to fit here too. It's not whether you get knocked down, it's whether you get up. Elijah got up. Elijah travels for 40 days to Mount Horeb, which is where Moses received the Ten Commandments. Elijah seeks shelter in a cave. He probably was happy to find a place to rest that was a shelter. A cave gave him protection, (laughs) as long as a bear or a lion wasn't using the same cave. I digress. Sorry. 1 Kings 19, verses 9b. But the Lord said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? That's a funny question since God sent him here, unless the accent is on the doing part, not the here part. Get it? What are you doing here or what are you doing here? I think it must have been the on the doing, but that's my thought. Maybe God just wanted Elijah to talk. 1 Kings 19, verse 10. Elijah replied, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. Really? Elijah was resting on his laurels, kind of like people who think they will get to heaven because they've been a good person. Elijah responds that even though he has been working hard for the Lord, the people of God had abandoned the covenant, and Elijah is the only one left. Sounds a little like whining when things get tough to me. Self-pity and self-righteousness are not very pretty character traits. They also are not very self-reflective, which I think that is exactly what God wants Elijah to do. But God is patient, so he goes visual. Chapter 19, verses 11 through 12a. Get out and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord told him. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by, and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. God tells him to go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, but the Lord is to pass by. Along came a terrible wind, smashed the rocks, but the Lord wasn't in the wind. Then came the earthquake, but he was not in the earthquake. And then a fire. Verses 12b to 13a. And after the fire, there was a sound of a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. After the fire, there was a gentle whisper. Elijah's condition at this time was very sensitive. It was vulnerable, precarious, and God coming down on him with any of the first three natural examples was not what Elijah needed. What he really needed was a gentle whisper. Sometimes we need a two-by-four to the side of our head to get our attention, figuratively speaking now. But sometimes we need a gentle voice. Obviously it worked, because look at Elijah's reaction. He wrapped his face in his cloak. He hid his face as a sign of humility and of God's glory. And he came outside. That was the reaction that God wanted. And a voice said, What are you doing here, Elijah? Would Elijah answer differently this time? 
Verse 14, he replied again, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. Really? Again? The general whisper had not changed his attitude. Verses 15 to 18. The Lord, then the Lord said to him, Go back the same way you came and travel to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive there, anoint Hazael to be king of Aram. Then anoint Jehu, grandson of Nimshi, to be king of Israel. And anoint Elisha, son of Saphat, from the town of Abel Meholah, to replace you as my prophet. Anyone who escapes from Hazael will be killed by Jehu, and those who escape Jehu will be killed by Elisha. Yet I will preserve 7,000 others in Israel who have never bowed down to Baal or kissed him. Notice that God does not chastise or correct Elijah at this point. Instead, he went ahead with his next step in the plan. And then he finished with, oh, by the way, you really weren't the only one left. There are 7,000 others. Chapter 19, verses 19 and 20. So Elijah went and found Elisha, son of Saphat, plowing a field. There were 12 teams of oxen in the field, and Elisha was plowing with the 12th team. Elijah went over to him and threw his cloak across his shoulders and then walked away. Elisha left the oxen standing there and ran after Elijah and said to him, First let me go and kiss my father and mother goodbye, and then I will go with you. Elijah replied, Go on back, but think about what I have done for you. Elijah had to travel 160 miles to find Elisha, and Elisha was just a well-to-do farmer. But God knew something about Elijah, Elisha, just like he knew something about David. Thinking about Elijah, maybe he didn't want a successor, or maybe he was ready for one. We really don't know. Not everyone in the Bible has a successor. Moses had Joshua, but Joshua had none. Samuel had none, and Elisha will not have one. But Elisha's comment, you can see that he was not ready for this change in life. He knew what throwing the cloak over his shoulders meant. Isn't that the way it is for most of us? Things don't always go as we plan, and sometimes things pop up when we don't expect it. The important thing is, though, how we react. Verse 21. So Elisha returned to his oxen and slaughtered them. He used the wood from the plow to build a fire to roast their flesh. He passed around the meat to the townspeople, and they all ate. Then he went with Elijah as his assistant. Elisha was ready to not look back. He burned his plow and roasted his oxen. Can't get more serious than that. Now, I'm not going to read each of these verses coming up, but a lot is uh, written in here. Ahab continued to do wicked things in the eyes of God. Elijah meets up with Ahab again and states in 1 Kings chapter 21, verse 19, this is what the Lord God says. In the place where dogs licked up Naboth's blood, dogs will lick up your blood. And to Jezebel, he says in 1 Kings chapter 21, verse 23, dogs will devour Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. Jezebel died being thrown out of a window onto the street where she tramp was trampled by horses and dogs licked her blood. Actually, when they went out to bury her, they found nothing except her skull, her feet, and her hands. And that was from 2 Kings chapter 9, verse 35. In a solemn prophecy, Elijah forecasted a violent death for both Jezebel and Ahab. All this time, Elisha has been following Elijah. Second Kings now, chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were traveling from Gilgal, 
And Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, for the Lord has told me to go to Bethel. But Elisha replied, As surely as the Lord lives, and you yourself live, I will never leave you. So they went down together to Bethel. Elisha just didn't want to let go. Elisha had become very attached to Elijah. He has become very dedicated. Maybe he doesn't want to go it alone. Just a guess. After all, Elijah was certainly someone to follow and look up to. 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 4 and 6. Then Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, for the Lord has told me to go to Jericho. And Elisha replied again, As surely as the Lord lives and you yourself live, I will never leave you. So they went on together to Jericho. Then Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, for the Lord has told me to go to the Jordan River. But again Elisha replied, As surely as the Lord lives and you yourself live, I will never leave you. So they went on together. Get it? Elisha just doesn't want to be alone. He doesn't want to leave Elijah. Maybe you know someone who you feel the same way about. You have been so attached to them that you just don't want to even think about separating. 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 8-10 through 10. Then Elijah folded his cloak together and struck the water with it. The river divided, and the two of them went across on dry ground. When they came to the other side, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I can do for you before I am taken away. And Elisha replied, Please let me inherit a double share of your spirit and become your successor. You have asked a difficult thing, Elijah replied. If you see me when I am taken from you, then you will get your request. But if not, then you won't. The time has come, and Elisha must make the best of it. Elijah gives him one last request. It was a big one, and there was a requirement for it to be fulfilled. 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 11. As they were walking along and talking, suddenly a chariot of fire appeared, drawn by horses of fire. It drove between the two men, separating them, and Elijah was carried by a whirlwind into heaven. Elijah was taken up to heaven. Only Enoch was taken up without dying, when we can read that in Genesis chapter 5, verse 24. All right, some closing thoughts. So what are we to take away from this story? It certainly is an amazing story, but it has to be more than that. First of all, we all need a time of preparation if we are to serve God. The more God will use you, the more you will need preparation. Number two, understand that God never shows you all the steps from A to Z. So just get ready for A to B, and then B to C, and so on. Number three, learn patience. Elijah waited three years before he was told to move ahead with the next step. And number four, have you ever been to the mountain and then not long after been in a valley? Be ready for God to speak to you.